All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and uh, kick off another really exciting and informative session of MASSP's Leader to Leader. If I haven't met you before, my name is Wendy Zadeb. I'm the Executive Director at the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. And um, those of you who have already done introductions in the chat, that is fantastic. Uh, some of you might be more or less familiar with Zoom. So if you kind of scroll at the bottom of your screen, you will see some options for being able to participate today. And the chat is where we just do introductions or kind of make um, uh, collegial comments. But if you want to ask a question of one of our panelists, you want to make sure that you use the actual Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen as well. And I will be monitoring that and posing questions back to our panel. Bob, you want to advance the slide? So before we get going, I already mentioned the Q&A and the chat function. Just want to remind everyone that we will share the slide decks that we have today um, when we post the link to the recording. And we always like to remind everyone that um, your questions are captured. And of course, the uh, commentary by today's panelists as well in that recording and we do put it out on social media so it is pretty much open to everyone um, once it gets past here. Um, we, you know, the, the, the comments that we're going to have today, um, you know, we've got Dr. Katherine Strunk with us who is the Director of Educational Policy and innovation at the Innovation Collaborative for MSU and EPIC as more commonly known. And we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Shrunk with us today because you may be wondering, why do I keep having to do all these surveys? Why do we have to do these surveys every month? These surveys are too long. Who's even looking at this data? Well, Catherine's gonna tell you who's looking at it because she definitely is one of them. Um, we also have uh, MASSP's Bob Kefchen with us today, and you'll recall MASSP members that um, we did ask you to complete a survey for us as well. And Bob is going to talk to you about the results of the survey that was just MASSP's homegrown. And um, we've shared that data with Dr. Strunk so that she might be able to make some comparisons from what MASSP members were reporting in a smaller sample size than what she sees statewide. So I think that'll be um, kind of an interesting comparison for us as well. So uh, Dr. Shrunk and Bob Kefchen, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us today. Um, as usual, everyone, if you have questions, pop those in the chat and I will pose those or uh, either Bob or Catherine will answer those as, um, as, they, uh, as they have the opportunity to. So we will kick off with uh, Bob Kefchen. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Strunk and I flipped a coin before everybody got on today and she won, so I'm going first. Uh, what I'm gonna walk through are the key takeaways, and there are four of them, that we got from our uh, survey results. Uh, I'm also gonna note some of the limitations of our data uh, because it's important when having these conversations to acknowledge who responded and what the results are telling you based on who gave you those results. So to kick off, I'm gonna start with two elements because I think they link to one another and I think you'll see why in a second. The first key takeaway, and this is uh, one of the biggest that we got was that schools started in person and shifted more toward remote learning as the year progressed uh, based on what we saw. And, and that's not surprising um, as you know the orders went through that forced folks into remote learning. But remember that these survey data came through in early November before the uh, epidemic order came through that suspended nine through 12 in-person learning. Uh, so these results reflect a place where um, in-person learning was permitted, but more folks were shifting to some form of remote learning as the year progressed. And as I said, as of early November, a significant majority of schools though planned to return to in-person instruction in this upcoming term, uh, though they were looking at an increase in the use of hybrid models uh, and so when we surveyed folks, what we asked were, where are, you, where are the majority of your students uh, now uh, in terms of, are they in person? Are they hybrid? Uh, are they fully remote? How are they learning now? Where are the majority of your students learning? And then what percentage of your students are fully remote? And we asked that at three points in time, at the beginning of the school year, at the point in time that the survey was conducted in early November, 
And then what are you anticipating for next term? So when we look at this, this is the whole data set, not, not broken down into any sort of demographic breakdowns. What we found was at the beginning of the school year, 86 of our respondents were in person, uh, the single largest group uh, with a smaller group going hybrid and then uh, a significant chunk that were fully remote. But then as of the point of the survey, a lot of folks had moved to more fully remote learning and that that was the, the biggest chunk out there. Uh, and hybrid numbers had shrunk down uh, potentially because some of those folks who were hybrid moved to a fully remote setting. But then looking forward, more and more folks said they were going to try to get back to in-person with a significant interest in expanding hybrid learning. Uh, and that was, again, this is the full data set of everybody who responded to the survey. Uh, these trends bore out across different, um, across different demographic breakdowns. Uh, they seemed to hold up well enough uh, that we could report the full data set on these two findings. So what we ask in this particular piece is what percentage of your students, approximately what percentage are engaged in fully remote learning? Uh, and again, these numbers would tend to track with where were your students at the beginning and end of the year, um, uh, beginning, middle and end of the year. But what you're seeing is that even in districts that were doing hybrid models or in-person models, they had some percentage of their students who were engaged, some significant percentage of their students who were engaged in fully remote learning, whether they were uh, using a remote model or an in-person model or not. Uh, and I think we've seen that, I know talking to principals that I've seen that, that regardless of what model you're using, even if you're in person, you've got a percentage of your population that wants to just be online. And I think we see that reflected in these numbers here. So not particularly surprising given what we know about the policy shifts, uh, given what you folks are seeing on the ground. But when we see you know, our data, that's our survey data bear out what we would expect, uh, that at least lends some credibility and credence to the findings. Maybe the, more, the most startling uh, realization I had in going through these data was that it seemed that how a student attended school, whether it was in-person or hybrid or remote, was primarily determined by where they attended school. In other words, which district were they in? Uh, and so when we look at the beginning of the school year, we broke it down both by size of district and rural, suburban, and urban districts. And what we found is that if you are a larger building or a more urban building, you are much more likely to have been fully remote. If you are a smaller building or a more rural district, you are much more likely to go to school in person. Uh, and you would expect some correlation here, right? Because a lot of smaller districts, a lot of rural districts are smaller districts. They would tend into that class C, class D category for their school buildings. Um, but I think what you're seeing here is, and, and again, urban districts tend to have larger buildings, but there are a lot of suburban class A districts, a lot of suburban class B districts. Um, and still what you see is a pretty hefty trend. The more rural you are, the more likely you are to be in person, the more urban you are, the less likely you are to be in person. And the bigger you are and the smaller you are has the same correlation. And this bears out as we move forward. So this was the beginning of the school year. This is early November. And again, what we've just seen is we know that folks were shifting more remote in early November, but the same trends bear out. Even if you were shifting more remote, the pattern still holds. Um, in fact, of the urban districts we surveyed, 100% of them were fully remote at the point of this survey uh, in early November. In looking ahead to next term, we saw this hold again. Uh, the more urban you were, the more likely you were that you thought you would stay remote. Uh, the more rural, the more likely you thought it would be that you would be shifting back to in-person learning or shifting to in-person learning for the first time. Somewhat in line with this, but not necessarily in line with this, is that junior senior high schools are more likely to be doing some form of in-person instruction, while middle schools are less likely than other grade configurations to use hybrid models. 
Um, and the reason uh, I tease this out is because while you see junior, senior high schools a lot in rural settings and you would want to maybe conflate those two things, we saw this bear out even when the junior, senior high school was in an urban setting. Uh, although admittedly, we again, there are data limitations to this. So when we break this down beginning uh, of the school year, November, and then uh, looking ahead at next term, uh, your junior, senior high schools were much more likely to be in person. And then your middle levels uh, had big bands of, um, or had, had smaller bands of hybrid learning. Now that didn't seem to bear out looking into next term. It looked like there were a lot of middle level folks considering hybrid there, uh, but it was a distinctly smaller band, band of schools in the first two parts. So those were our four major key takeaways uh, from this, but I do wanna, before I end, I do wanna note that there are some limitations to these data and I'm hoping that Dr. Strunk will be able to uh, talk to us about where there are contrasting points of view based on uh, the data they're looking at, which is statewide data, every school in the state. So when we took a look at this, we noted that there were some geographic areas that were underrepresented. In particular, if you look at the map of MASSP's regions, which is how we broke down geographic diversity, uh, the west side of the state um, and Wayne County and Detroit did not uh, have nearly as many responses as we saw in uh, the Ingham County area in Northern Michigan uh, and Oakland County. So again, when you're looking at these data, recognize who responded and where the answers are coming from. Uh, we had pretty good diversity when it came to free and reduced lunch percentage. Uh, but as you might expect with MASSP's membership, uh, high school responses made up the, the single largest category of respondents. Um, and we didn't have as many urban responses as we got from suburban and rural districts, in part perhaps because you might have fewer uh, buildings in urban districts because they're larger, but uh, worth noting. And then larger districts, class A districts, were the single largest category. So as we're looking at these things, keep those pieces in mind. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about our data set, um, but I'm also happy to hand it right over to Dr. Strunk. Uh, and let her present what Epic is finding uh, so that you guys can see the, you know, the, the variations between our data sets. Wendy, I'm having trouble pulling up the Q&A. Are there any questions in there that I need to answer? No, we don't have any in the queue. All right. Well, I'll stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Strunk uh, take over with her presentation. Uh, and maybe we'll find some questions as we move through that. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see a big green blob? Yes. Okay. Um, so we, as Wendy and Bob noted, our data come that, that are similar to the data you were just talking about. So we're gonna talk about two things today. Um, one, our, our understanding of the kinds of instruction modality that's being offered and to whom um, across the state. And those come from a data set that has been collected by the state in collaboration with us and MDE and CEPI. And we do have coverage of almost the entire state. Um, and that's something that you all are filling out every month. Uh, and we appreciate that. And then the second piece, if we have time, will be we actually have been fielding surveys to educators. Uh, you probably have all seen my name in your inbox from both last spring and this fall. We're gonna focus today on the fall results if, if we have some time to understand sort of what educators are thinking about how schooling is going this, this semester or last semester. Um, just, in case, oops, just in case folks don't know much about EPIC, I'm gonna quickly just introduce you to who we are. Um, we are an independent nonpartisan research center at Michigan, uh, University, Michigan State University. Uh, we do partner with MDE and CEPI quite a bit. Um, we've also worked to partner with local districts across the state to make sure we're providing what we call research with consequence. So we want to partner with policymakers and practitioners to be able to provide answers to the questions that are most important to you. Um, we do this through a lot of different ways. We utilize the administrative data sets that the state collects on teachers and students and principals to understand sort of macro trends that are happening across the state. And then we also field our own surveys and we do qualitative work as well. So many of you, I recognize all the districts that have been popping into the, into the, uh, into the comment sections 
folks that we've, we've been talking to quite a bit. Um, one of the things that really hit us back last March and April is that we have, we always feel a strong responsibility to Michigan educators. That is our entire goal is to provide as much evidence as possible to help inform policy and practice about education in Michigan. Um, once the pandemic hit, we felt like we had an even greater responsibility to make sure that we were supporting educators who are working so hard to support our students. So what we've been really trying to do is provide the best available evidence so that policymakers at the school, district, state level can make the best, most informed decisions possible. And we're always open for questions or ideas from, from anyone. Um, so here are the data we'll use today. I kind of mentioned this already. Oops, the first piece we're not using today, I took that out. So we're just gonna look at the continuity of learning plans and the extended COVID learning plans that you guys have all been submitting every month, our surveys. And then we match this with data from the, the state data sets to look at sort of the kind of cuts that Bob was just talking about. So by different kinds of districts or different kinds of enrollment. Um, and so we'll use all those data together. Exactly like Bob said, we wanna make sure everyone understands um, some of the issues with the data. So the eCall data, the extended COVID learning plans data, those are pretty much around from the whole state. It's almost in the entire population of the state. But for the survey data for the spring, for the fall survey, we had about an 8% response rate from teachers and 10% from principals for a total of about 7,200 that should say K through 12 educators, I'm sorry, and a, from 730 districts, whether they're LEAs or PSAs in the state. So about 87% of districts in the state did at least provide one response or more to our survey. Um, anything you see about teachers, we do have slightly lower proportions, but very slight of male teachers, uh, newer teachers, elementary teachers, black teachers and teachers from suburbs and town. <clears throat> Those same things, for the most part, uh, matter for our principal survey as well. But for principals, we had slightly higher proportions of, teach of educators who are from PSA, from partnership districts across the state, from districts that have low broadband internet access, so lower levels across the state, and then also from the lower income districts. Okay, so let's talk about the e-call plans first. Um, the way we coded these up is, is we tried to understand which districts were offering what kind of instruction to their students in each month of the school year this year. So we classified them in five ways. The first is fully in-person, so you're only providing uh, <clears throat> students with in-person instruction. Um, then there's the fully remote. These are districts that are only providing remote instruction. And then there's the hybrid only, so the districts that are only providing hybrid instruction. And then we classify fully in-person options. These are districts that are providing either in-person or hybrid or in-person or remote education options. And then there's the hybrid option, those that are providing hybrid or remote options for their students. So here's what it looks like across the each month of the school year so far. So August is what districts said they were planning to do and probably return to school. And December is the most recent uh, data collection that we have coded so far. And what you can see sort of echoes what Bob was saying from your all data, but not quite. So we pretty much saw, if you add those top two rows together, we got about 59% of districts were offering the option to kids to be in person full time in August. And that stayed pretty consistent across the school year for August, September, October, and November. Again, these are plans that were collected in the beginning of each month. So if something changed in the middle of November, for instance, the executive order, we wouldn't capture it in the November plan. We would capture it in December. And there's where you see, I think what Bob, um, you were sort of alluding to a little earlier, we dropped from about 59% of districts offering in-person instruction to their students to only 40%. And on the flip side, you see the remote only in that second to bottom row growing pretty exceptionally. So you saw only 12% of districts in August were planning on being fully remote. That went to 23% in September. I think as things started to shape up and schools started to go back, we saw kind of a number of districts switch from remote, uh, switch from something else into remote. But then it went back down in October and November. And then suddenly it shoots up to nearly half of the districts in the state were um, planning on offering fully remote only in December. This is just another way of looking at it. So you can kind of see it um, graphically. And again, this, the same point applies. And here we show it by, we wait by students. So we're saying, you know, to Bob's point, small, you will see in our, our data too in a minute um, that we do find that rural and smaller districts are more likely to be in person, urban districts more likely to be remote. And so we wanted to wait by the student count <clears throat> to see how many students were being offered each kind of instructional modality. And you can see the same patterns exist, but 
because the larger urban districts are more likely to be remote, you see an even greater proportion of students only being offered remote education in Michigan in December. And then <clears throat> to get at the point about regions, here's what you see over time. So we have the August plans, November and December, and you can see kind of the purple is fully remote only. And the green, the dark and the Kelly green, those are offering at least the option to be in person. And what you see is a lot more green in August and November, and it switches pretty heavily to purple in December. So you're really seeing how this looks for going, um, going remote. And you see what we would kind of expect. Um, it happens all over the state, but it really is happening close kind of around some of these urban suburban areas. Um, but like Bob said also, we know that not all students took up the option to be in person, even if they were offered it. So there was a lot of parent and family choice involved here. And so what we show here is we asked, or you all are providing, I think, or your superintendents are providing um, uh, information to MDE and CEPI every month about an, what proportion of students are actually taking up each kind of instruction in person, remote, or hybrid each month. And we asked it in ranges. So it's not too fine grained and that's why you see kind of the bars here. And what you see is that in September and October and November, even though you know upwards of 59% of districts were offering in-person instruction, only about 43% of kids were taking it up on at the max and as low as maybe 28%. Somewhere between 28 and 43% of kids were actually learning in person each month, even though well over half of the districts were offering in-person instruction. You see it drop tremendously in December. So only about 17 to 26% of students were estimated to be learning in person. Right below it, you see the remote and you see the flip happening, right? So while in November, about a third to a little over a half of students were learning fully remotely, by December, it became two thirds to three quarters. Hybrid instruction has been sort of the least popular option for students across the, uh, the whole time period, but in in December, only between six and 11% of students were estimated to be learning in a hybrid format. So here's how we break it down. Those are kind of small, sorry, you can't really see them. Um, but the, this we're looking now here at breaking it down by economically disadvantaged. And so on the top is the districts that are very low proportions of economically disadvantaged in the state. These are the higher wealth districts. And on the bottom, you have the high proportion of economic disadvantage. These are the kind of lower income districts and then the middle in the middle. And what you can see, again, the same colors apply. And what you can see is across the board, um, lower income districts on the very bottom, those four rows in the bottom, they were far more likely to be offering remote instruction only. And it was the higher income districts uh, that were more likely to be offering in-person instruction to some extent. And then you can see in December what, what happens. And so the districts that are, have high proportions of, of low income students, you know, nearly all of them, something like 80%, uh, 75% were offering just a remote option for kids. Here it is, we break it up for, for black students. This is again, the, uh, the top is the district with the lowest proportion of black students and the bottom is with the highest proportion of black students and the same basic patterns apply. And this is by urban versus rural and suburban town. So urban on the top, rural on the bottom. And we see sort of the same uh, patterns again. So you see um, fully in-person options in rural on the bottom are, are much more pre prevalent throughout the entire semester. Whereas in the urban areas on top, it's way more remote. Some additional findings from the, the plan that you all are filling out. Um, we did ask questions about hybrid modalities. So when that is being offered, how many days are in person each week? Uh, it's about two to three and a quarter days each week in person. And this was pretty consistent across grade levels, but we did see a bigger spread in high schools. So there were more high schools that there was more variation in the high schools. So some high schools were more like two days a week, some are more like four days a week. Um, and it was unclear, sort of there wasn't as much of a, a clear tendency. Um, we also asked about the proportion of time when you're doing ace, when you're doing remote instruction, the proportion of time that's synchronous versus asynchronous. And districts told us that when their students are learning fully remotely, um, they re receive synchronous instruction about 30 to 60% of the time. 
Uh, this is pretty consistent across grade levels, although it seems like high schoolers might be learning a little less synchronously when they're remote at the beginning of the school year. Uh, charter school districts were less likely than traditional school districts to offer fully in-person schooling and more likely to offer hybrid and fully remote schooling, but that is um, very much correlated with their locality and where they are located in the state. And then also districts with lower levels of broadband internet access were far more likely to offer in-person instruction, although that gap kind of diminished over time. So that seemed to really matter in August and September, but then as we kind of went to the semester, that didn't seem to be as much of a driving force. Okay, Bob, do you want me to pause here since this is the part of our stuff that is similar and we can take questions together and then I can go on to the educator survey or do you want me to keep on storming through? Well, so far we don't have anything in the Q&A. <clears throat> I was wondering, I'll, I, I'd like one answer and since I get to ask, we'll go for it. Uh, you had talked about synchronous versus asynchronous learning um, and that, that high schoolers were slightly more likely to be asynchronous than synchronous. Um, what what kind of difference are we talking about between high schoolers and other grades with asynchronous? And were there any trends within synchronicity? Were certain districts more likely or less likely to be synchronous? I don't believe we saw much difference in, in kind of which kinds of districts more likely to be synchronous. I'd have to go back and double check, but I, I don't think we saw any patterns there. Um, it wasn't a huge difference between high schools and middle or elementary schools in terms of that, but it, it was enough, maybe I want to say like five percentage points, that I'd have to check and come back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't see any questions in our Q&A, so I think let's move on to the survey data. And uh, Great. If, if there are questions at the end, we can always pick it back up. Wonderful. So I should say that we did this survey um, in partnership with MDE because MDE has been incredibly interested in hearing educators' voices about how schooling is going and what can be improved. Um, so when you get the EPIC surveys in your inbox, um, they are always in partnership with MDE. They're always an attempt to provide policymakers with educator voice. So one of the things that I think is often missing from policymaking conversations about education our educators' voices are the voices of teachers and principals and superintendents who are the ones on the ground delivering instruction. And um, we try really hard at Epic and MDE to make sure that we're providing some sort of systematic understanding of what folks are saying. That's my, please fill out our surveys from now on when you get them, plug. Um, so here is a, is a kind of a busy graph. So let me kind of walk you through it. We have teachers and principals here. We're looking at what educators said their concerns about the impact of COVID-19 are on their students. And we've centered each graph at zero. So on the green and the, the kind of green and the dark blue bars to the right of the zero, that tells us the proportion of educators who said they were very con extremely concerned or concerned. And then the kind of light blue and purple blocks um, were the ones that said that they were not at all concerned or only somewhat concerned. And the gray is they didn't respond to the question. And so what I try to focus on are those green and blue bars to the right of the um, of the zero lines in each. And then each row, each bar is about one of the different items that we asked about. And I know this is small. And so I promised Wendy, I would send it your way so that you all could have it to look at after. Um, but what I wanted to kind of show here is that educators expressed a lot of concern about the ways in which the pandemic has impacted students in both their academic learning and their sort of socio-emotional and health well-being. So one of the things that principals said they were the most concerned about were students being impacted by grief and trauma related to COVID-19. Similarly, they were worried about students falling behind in literacy and ELA and in math, students missing instructional time, students missing social interactions with their peers, the health and safety of students who are experiencing homelessness, and the health and safety of students who need external social uh, support services. Um, principals were you know, pretty concerned about this. Nearly three quarters of principals expressed this as a, as a very substantial concern. We then wanted to understand a little bit about if this differed by the different kinds of um, modalities that were being offered. This was tricky because even in districts that are fully in person, the far majority of them are offering a remote option. And so we asked teachers to tell us, are you, in per are you providing instruction in person? Are you providing instruction remotely? Or are you providing some of each? So kind of in a mixed format. So that's what you see here. This is a teacher's telling us what he or she is providing, how they are providing their instruction. 
And what you can see is that teachers that deliver their instruction remotely, they seem to express greater concerns about the health and safety and socio-emotional needs of their students. One thing that we've been hearing a lot about is access to technology and the internet. And so we know that districts have been really trying to get um, students and staff to have access to an internet or to a one-to-one -one computing device. And so the dark green bars here are responses from educators that told us that they were, that their districts were trying to provide devices to students and their staff. And the lighter green bars are the internet. They're providing the internet, some sort of internet access to students and staff. And you see, you know, nearly all, about 90% of districts across the board are trying to provide uh, devices to their students. Maybe about three quarters on average are trying to provide um, internet access to their students. And then we break it down by districts that are high, middle, and low economically disadvantaged. So their student population, whether their student population has high, middle, or low proportions of Black, Latinx students. And then the bottom is their urban, suburban, or rural location. And what we can see here is that there is some variation in those sort of Kelly green bar, such that districts with higher proportions of economically disadvantaged students, with black students, higher proportions of Latinx students, and then more urban districts are more likely to try to get their students and their staff with internet. And yet educators are reporting a lot of challenges with implementing remote instruction because of technology um, and, and access. And so, those bottom two rows on this graph tell us again, it's at the zero and there's teachers on the left, principals on the right. And you can see that over 50% of principals tell us that internet access for their students is a severe or is a, is a severe or somewhat of a challenge. Um, and for, for teachers, it's almost 50%. Slightly less are worried about um, access to reliable device, but it's still closing in on 50% for principals. Um, we also asked about whether or not kids were having trouble because they weren't able to get assistance at home from whoever's at home with them. And so you saw a lot of principals and teachers telling us that there was concerns because their family members of the students were unable to assist the students with remote learning, whether it's because of a lack of content knowledge, they have other responsibilities, or there's technology constraints. So we then asked teachers and principals sort of what resources would be helpful to you to, when you're providing remote instruction. And principals and teachers both told us, you know, over 50% told us all the time and closing in on 75% often that they needed better internet access for their students, that they need improved electronic learning resources. So these are things that they can help kids with at home remotely to learn. They also said that students needed more access to reliable devices and that they, they really wanted virtual training resources for teachers on effective remote instructional strategies. So 75% or more than that, about 80% of principals said that they needed that um, and about 65% of teachers. They also were hoping for ready-made lessons that they or their teachers could deliver through video or virtual conferencing. So is there anything out of the box that they can do to help them sort of get their remote instruction running? Another one of the major factors we've been hearing about is student engagement, how difficult it is to engage with students in a remote format um, or any format this semester, really. So we actually asked all the different principals and teachers, this I think we're just showing teachers here, uh, whether or not they faced difficulties with maintaining engagement, that's the green bar, maintaining attendance, that's the dark blue bar, and locating students, that's the light blue bar. The top shows for all the teachers in our sample, and then we split it up by modality, whether or not the teachers are offering instruction in person in a mixed or remote modality, and also by economic disadvantage, whether they're in a high or low economic disadvantage district. And you can see that on average, almost 70% of teachers said that they were struggling with maintaining student engagement. A little over 50% said they were struggling with maintaining attendance, and about 40% said they were having difficulties locating their students. Uh, when you look at it by modality that the teacher is offering, so again, now I'm looking at the green bars in that second set of bars, you see that um, for, for remote and mixed teachers, they're having more difficulty maintaining engagement and more difficulty locating their students. 
Similarly, for districts that have high proportions and middle proportions of economically disadvantaged students, they're having more difficulty maintaining attendance and more difficulty locating their students. So this to us was surfacing some equity concerns, right? These are the teachers that are struggling the most and they're often in these districts that have the highest proportion of low income students. Other challenges that teachers told us they were facing, um, I wanna kind of draw your attention to the very bottom row and you'll see that we asked about how, you know, are you facing challenges to what extent with balancing your teaching and leadership responsibilities and there are other responsibilities at home. And about 60% of teachers reported that they were facing moderate or great challenges with balancing their responsibilities both in their work and in their personal life at home. We also saw challenges providing literacy services to students who needed extra support, providing services and supports to hybrid or remote students, and continuing to implement um, multi-tiered support systems to hybrid and remote students, as well as just providing services and supports to students with disabilities overall. We asked a bit about the PD that teachers had been getting, and we asked how useful it was. So I wanna note a couple of things. One, a lot of teachers didn't respond to this question, and that meant that they did not receive this type of professional development. And so all of the bars together, the four sort of colored bars, tell us what teachers said they actually received. And you can see that most teachers said they received PD on how to use specific learning management systems or platforms like Google or Zoom or Seesaw. Um, and that those were pretty useful. Similarly, many teachers reported receiving PD on how to use technology devices for instruction, like their laptop or a Chromebook, and that those were pretty useful. Um, but you see at the very bottom, very few teachers reported receiving PD to learn about best practices for effectively delivering interventions in a hybrid setting, and those that did said it wasn't particularly useful. Uh, best practices for effectively delivering instruction in a hybrid setting. Uh, similarly for remote settings. So there didn't seem to be a lot of PD offered for how to provide effective instruction as much as how to use the technology. So we focused a bit on the provision of special education services because we heard from a lot of educators this was highly problematic. This is um, a slightly different graph. And so I wanna note that that teal bar, the lighter blue bar, that shows no change. And we asked educators can you please tell us um, whether the pandemic has had a negative impact or a positive impact or basically no impact on these particular special education services? And we asked about things like your ability to implement your district's multi-tiered support system to ensure students receive necessary services, your ability to provide a free and appropriate public education to all students, um, supports guaranteed under the IEPs. And what you can see is that for teachers on the left, fewer than a quarter for the most part Said that it was either unchanged or um, had a positive impact on it. And most of it is unchanged, right? Almost everyone has that blue bar on the right side of the zero line. But you see a lot of the dark blue and purple bars. So that's telling us that, you know, over a quarter, usually like close a third to 45% of teachers are saying that the pandemic has had a negative impact on their ability to provide all sorts of special education services. And principals are saying about the same and even a little bit more, closing in on 50% for most of these. We asked if this differed by fully in-person, mixed or remote instruction modality for teachers. And I think it's a pretty clear takeaway here. So again, that purple and dark blue are the fully remote and mixed modality teachers and the green are the fully in-person teachers. And you see that the, the fully remote and the mixed modality teachers, for the most part, always say that they have um, that the pandemic has more negatively affected their ability to provide special education services. The one thing that that's not true for is that we asked about the availability of special ed teachers and para pros who provide special education services. And fully remote teachers said that this was actually, um, they were the least likely to say that this was negatively impacted. We're not really sure why that is, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Closing in on the end of our slides here. So um, we also asked about what teachers would prefer to be doing. Would they prefer to be teaching in person, fully remote, or hybrid? And you can see that, um, so sorry, in the top set of bars, we cut it by what kind of teacher they were already, in person, mixed, or remote. On the second set of bars, we 
cut it by the proportion of economically disadvantaged students in their district. And then we cut it by urban, suburban, and rural in those bottom three bars. Looking at the top bars, it's kind of interesting. You can see that um, somewhere around 35% of teachers who were already in person said they preferred to teach in person. And far fewer of the in-person teachers said they preferred to teach remotely, as opposed to that bottom row, the third of the top panel, which shows that um, only about 15, 17% of remote teachers said they wanted to be in person. And for the most part, remote teachers said they wanted to stay remote. Similarly, on the sort of middle bars, you see that there wasn't as much of a differentiation between districts that were low, middle, and high um, proportions of students with, that are low income. But districts that had high proportions of students with low income were more likely to say that they wanted to stay remote. Of course, don't forget that those were the districts that were already remote. And same thing for urbanicity. So then we asked teachers, what would affect your willingness to return to in-person instruction? And what was really striking to us and not at all surprising was that educators were far more likely to say that they, were, they would be most impacted in a, in a positive direction to return to in-person instruction in order to help their students. And it wasn't so much about the health and safety, right? It was kind of these bottom areas, um, the bottom rows on the, on the both graphs show that, uh, that about 25, 30% of, of teachers and more than that of principals said that they were most interested in going back to kind of help students learn with who are ELs, to help students who have IEPs or 504 plans, the impact on learning for, for all their students. So they were really focusing on the need to return in person to be able to reach their students and especially those who were struggling. Okay, our last slide. Um, we heard a lot over the summer about the likelihood of teachers leaving the, the, the profession or, and, and because of COVID. So we asked teachers and principals, did you think about leaving the teacher profession, leaving your school, leaving your district as a result of COVID-19? Um, and what you see here, again, at the zero line, principals are on the bottom, teachers are on the top. You can see teachers were far more likely than principals to report having considered leaving the profession in particular due to COVID-19. So the, and the green parts of these bars are teachers that said they actively sought out other options to leave the profession, leave their school or leave their district. Um, and we see about <clears throat> four to five percent of principals actively sought out other options and eight to nine percent of teachers. But almost 50 percent, about 45 percent of teachers said that they thought to some extent about leaving the profession with, uh, overall, and about 35% said that they, or 30% said they thought about leaving their school or district. This is compared to about 15% of principals who said they thought about leaving their school or district, and about 25% of principals said they thought about leaving the profession. Okay, so that's it for us. I'm happy to, oh, I've got one more slide, just kidding. So the last slide is just sort of a, a recap. And so I wanted to think about what lessons can be learned from the data that we've been collecting and you've been collecting, others from around the state have been collecting. And I think it's important to remember that what we're all showing is it's important to equip all students with the technology and internet access so they can engage in any kind of modality, but that that's not always enough to just equip them. That students and their families also need supports as do educators to use these resources well. We also want to continue focusing on our efforts on both the instruction and the student support services side. So it's not just about learning, it's about the socio-emotional health of our kids, particularly in our lower achieving and economically disadvantaged districts. We also want to think about expanding access to PD. We saw that there wasn't a ton of PD being offered on how to do this well as much as this how to do it at all. And that all these data points keep on showing us that it's there's inequity in the system right now. And so how do we keep equity at the forefront when we're planning for high quality instruction, regardless of the strategy we're using to provide the instruction? And that is the last slide. So now I can take any questions that we have. I kept coming up with questions, Catherine, and then you kept answering them as soon as I came up with them. So I, I'm feeling kind of stymied here. Oh, good. Um, well, that's so let me, let, let me kick off with one thing, and it's, we're not going back to the E. coli data, but maybe crosswalking here. You identified at the very end um, challenges and next steps uh, that you saw indicated by the survey data um, 
on ways that districts could move forward with addressing some of the concerns that the survey data brought forward. In reviewing the ECOL plans, did you see answers to some of those or strategies that principals could use in addressing those that were either trends or um, that you saw more frequently in districts with fewer problems? Uh, what kind of strategies might the data suggest? That's a great question. And unfortunately, we don't have an answer to from the data here. We were balancing, you know, we had many discussions with Steffi and MDE about how to balance the load on administrators when they had to fill out the data and fill out those surveys with the kind of sort of minuteness of the data we could collect. And so we ended up not asking a lot of questions about strategies that were in the plans as much as just the basic instruction modality and synchronicity and things like that. Are there particular strategy or are there particular areas uh, looking at your uh, recommendations, uh, your next steps that you think would be um, things that principals should focus on, uh, stuff that can be done at the building level more than things that would require intervention at central office um, or that sort, of, um, that sort of level? Yeah, that's a great question. There was clearly a lot of concern about provision of resources for special education students? And how do we make sure that our students on IEPs and 504s are actually getting the services that they need? Um, how do we even identify those students right now when we're in a hybrid or we're having, even if we're in person, there's a lot of you know, barriers in the way to working one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, I think it'd be really important for district and school leaders and teachers to think about how can we, I mean, I think everyone has it top of mind anyway, but what are the things that we can do to make sure that we're providing those kids in particular with, the best instruction we can provide them given the situation. Um, not that no one's thinking about that now, but if there was some way that we could get everyone together to consider what are those resources, what can we do together to make sure that we're providing these students with, with what they need, I think that would be incredibly helpful. And it's not just a Michigan problem, it's all over the country. This is happening, we're hearing about it everywhere. So Dr. Strunk, I'm curious what, um, I, I know that you've already uh, testified, um, I can't remember if it was before both House and Senate education committees or just one or the other, um, and that you've also shared this data with the Michigan um, Board of Education and with Dr. Rice and, and the department in general. So what are your plans in the future or what has been the ask in terms of those types of updates and how long do you think that we will continue to survey and gather this information? So I'm speaking a little out of turn in terms of the last question, um, but I think our I think our plan with MDE and CEPI is to collect the e-call data until they're no longer needed. And so until there is no longer a need to think specifically about COVID instruction. Um, so I think once a month until everyone is back in person sort of business as usual. Um, what are the plans? We continue to work very closely with CEPI and MDE to provide an updated report on the eCall plans every month at the same day that CEPI releases their dashboard. And so the attempt is to have the dashboard come out with sort of very clear descriptives, and then we can go a little bit deeper and sort of understand some of the more fine-grained aspects of this, which kind of districts, things like that. Um, so we have, we've been really impressed. One of the things I think has been great about Michigan is not many states are actually collecting these data. So I think I can think off the top of my head about four or five. And so this is enabling us to understand a lot more in Michigan. And there seems to be a hunger here for actually getting the data and being able to think through what that means for our students. Um, so we, we're sort of out there willing to talk to anyone about these data and cut them any way that makes it useful for them. So if, you, you know, now this has been out for a while, are you, um, and I know as a researcher, you never want to modify the questions, right? You want to like keep asking the same consistent data, but if you could go back at, at you know, and say, oh, I wish we would have asked, you know, a certain thing. Is there something that you think maybe is missing that you wish that could have been added? Yeah, a couple things. I wish we understood what safety precautions were happening inside of schools for both educators and students. There's a lot of very understandable concern about being back inside school buildings right now. And we just have no idea what schools and districts are doing to be able to make their teachers and staff and students more safe. And we could learn from each other if we knew what we were doing. And we just, I don't know how to, so we didn't collect that information. I think it would have been really valuable. That's one. The second thing is, if there was any way to collect strategies about how we are actually, like very simple strategies about how we are um, teaching our special needs students or reaching our ELs, 
that would have been also, I think, really helpful. I have two kids in public schools right here. Uh, one of them has a special need. And I know that for a while he was back in person one-on-one -on -one with his provider in a learning lab. That was amazing. I don't know how many other districts knew that was happening and could have modeled their work off of that. Great, Bob, did you have a- uh, Well, there was a, first I wanna to get to Marie's question uh, in the Q and A. She asked, did you find better learning results in districts doing synchronous versus asynchronous learning? And I don't know, did you, did you look at results? Have you, have you paired this with any results data? We have not yet. Um, so as you all know, everyone is taking benchmark assessments in the fall and the spring, and we will be working uh, with those data to be able to understand how learning growth has happened over the year. And we'll try to understand how that's associated with these different things. Given that we don't have the spring test yet, it will, it's hard for us to know sort of any learning growth associations. Uh, and then one, being the, the association's lobbyist, I have to ask, uh, you've done this presentation, as Wendy pointed out, to um, you know, the policy committees in the House and Senate. Um, looking at these data, what policy implications do you see? Not necessarily things that local districts need to address, but maybe policy obstacles or things that you see coming up that would be more legislator-focused uh, topics. Yeah. I think there are strong implications for the budget, right? And so I think that uh, as we're thinking about CARES funding, as we're thinking about the next set of funding that comes in, one thing that just screams out to me is the need for more. We, we need to provide more resources to our educators so that they can provide more resources to our students. And I think that, you know, I've been trying to scream that as loud as I can across the state. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, share this data with us. And we would like to um, reserve the right to recall you as a witness here so that you can come back and maybe give us an update in a couple of months. Um, you know, I, I, I anticipate, you know, like obviously there's, there's, you know, been a push from the governor's office to try to um, help schools get back to school and, um, you know, as you know, on Friday, well, I don't know if you know, but on Friday, we're doing a uh, webinar with uh, Brandy Johnson um, from the governor's office to talk about rapid response testing. So it will be interesting to see, you know, how things change here pretty quickly in terms of people going back face to face um, and what that's going to look like and, and how that's going to change your um, the data that you receive and, and what we see. So I'd love to be able to talk with you again, you know, like I said, down the line and, and see how things are going. And uh, I think it's really interesting and I'm, I'm appreciative of you compiling the data and, you know, about the, the goals that you listed about students being, you know, important and teachers being important. And, you know, I, I think, you know, people that know that this is coming from Michigan State obviously realize that this isn't a partisan thing where your you know, goal is to find what the gotchas are in the data, you know, so certainly appreciate that for sure. And thank you so much, Bob, also for putting together the MASSP research and uh, for being able to find those connections um, between the two. So thank you both. Thank and you. Everyone that um, is still on with us, when we are talking about tomorrow's webinar, which we didn't call a leader to leader particularly because we just have um, Brandy Johnson from the governor's office and also the physician that is in charge of rap rapid response testing for the state. So that webinar is tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, the second kind of um, maybe natural uh, question or response after tomorrow's webinar will be, whoa, how would I implement that? What does that look like in a school? And so next week on Wednesday, we have a panel of principals and athletic directors who have already um, been using rapid response testing with their athletic uh, programs. So they can talk to us about what does that look like? You know, what are the protocols in place? What does the paperwork look like? What's the parent communication around that? And then I've also asked them to kind of think forward, you know, if, uh, this is available and free from uh, the governor's office to all schools in Michigan. Would you be implementing this, you know, more broadly with your student population and what will that look like? So that will be our follow-up webinar to tomorrow's and we're looking forward to a lot more discussion with so many things that just come and keep coming up during the pandemic. So thanks everyone for joining us. Looking forward to tomorrow and next week.